This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. Just a note, there's an excellent book on this case. I think the author is an engineer from Wisconsin who's also a deer hunting enthusiast. He also went to the trial and took copious notes. The book was impressive. He referred to the perpetrator's wives as wife one, wife two, and wife three to protect our identity, and I'm going to follow suit in this episode. This case was big in Wisconsin. It increased tensions between northern Wisconsinites and Hmong communities. Hmong people were worried that they would be blamed for the shooter's devastating decisions. Some family members of the murdered hunters did not want the community to make this case about race, but the truth was it was unavoidable. After the murders, bumper stickers started appearing on cars that said, Save a deer, kill a Hmong. Hmong businesses were vandalized. The perpetrator's house was burnt to the ground the year he was convicted. Two years later, A white Wisconsin hunter claimed self-defense when he killed a Hmong hunter and hid the body. I'll probably cover that case as well. In the documentary I watched, someone made an excellent point. This trial was a little like the OJ trial, and you might have a totally different experience when you looked at the case through the lens of your race. It really split the community apart. If you felt you couldn't trust either the statements from the two survivors or from the perpetrator, the forensics did tell the story of what happened. You're listening to episode 53, Chai Suo Vang. In the late 1960s, the Vietnam War had moved into Laos, so the CIA formed an alliance with the Hmong people to fight the communists. The United States government provided the weapons, and the Hmong provided the soldiers. Hmong soldiers disrupted the supply routes between Laos and Vietnam to the west, as instructed. The United States withdrew from the war, and communist forces swept through southern Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. The Hmong paid a great price for helping the United States because the communists launched a genocide against the Hmong people in Laos. Sher Kyu Vang was a lieutenant in the war, and his wife Seo Hong was a nurse. Sher Kyu Vang, his wife, and their four children, including Chai Suo, walked through the jungle in 1975 until they arrived at a refugee camp in Thailand. They stayed there for five years until they were granted political asylum because of Chair Vang and his help with the war efforts. 90% of the Hmong war refugees were moved to California, Minnesota, or Wisconsin, but thousands were left behind in Laos and were killed in the genocide. Hmong culture places an importance on family relationships and structure. Family ties are so important, in fact, that The family name comes first in a person's full name. In Laos, Chai's full name was Vang Chai Sua. In the United States, the order of his name was changed to an Americanized nomenclature of Chai Sua Vang. Chai Vang was born on September 24, 1968. He was seven years old when he left Laos for the refugee camp in Thailand, and he landed in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1980 when he was 12. In traditional Hmong culture, it was common for teenagers to marry. Chai married his first wife when he was in high school. She stated that their marriage was not arranged, but Chai had claimed that it was. His father had been fond of this girl, even though Chai had been less enthusiastic. One day, Chai and his wife got into a consequential fight, and he ended up pushing her. Wife number one went right to Chai's father, and he looked for a son to discipline him but Chai ran away from home. Chair Vang championed physical punishment. In addition to berating his children for their misbehaviors, he had no problem giving them a good kick to the shins. Once Chai graduated from high school, he decided he was done with dealing with punishments from his father and told him that he was going to kick him back. He no longer endured physical punishments after that day. Many Americans were opposed to the Vietnam War. 
when soldiers returned to the United States, they did not receive a warm reception. The same thing happened to the Hmong people. Many Americans were confused and thought we fought against the Hmong during the war and failed to understand that they were our allies. This led to discrimination of Hmong Americans. Chai Vang often got picked on in school because of this. Either he had a short temper because he was already pushing around wife number one, or he possibly developed one from being bullied during his teenage years. Either way, Chai got into fights with his classmates. They suspended him from school a few times, and he was no stranger to after-school detention. In 1985, Chai Vang moved the whole family to Stockton, California. Chai's wife graduated from high school the next year, and he enlisted in California's National Guard. Chai made positive contributions with his military service and was given recognition for being a good leader. He earned his sharpshooter qualification during his six years of service in the Guard and received an honorable discharge. During this time, Chai also received an associate degree in business administration from the San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton. In 1990, Chai and his wife moved in together and had not lived together until that time, even though they had three kids. Chai got his commercial driver's license and became a long-distance trucker. He was gone all the time, and his wife was alone in Stockton, raising their children. She was tired of Chai not being home, so they moved back to St. Paul, Minnesota, where he could just drive locally and be home to co-parent the kids with his wife. Besides driving trucks, Chai traveled to Thailand in 1994 to receive shaman training because he felt a calling to it. It was Christmas Eve 2001 when police received a 911 call from one of the Vang children asking for help. They were worried that their father was going to hurt their mother. Chai's wife invited some of his friends over for dinner. Later that night, he questioned why she invited other men over to the house. The comment bothered her so much that she produced a birth certificate for a child that Chai had fathered outside of their marriage. Chai's name was clearly listed on this document as being the father. He lost his temper, and he pointed a loaded gun at wife number one, and that was when the children stepped in and got between their parents. The police broke up the fight, and put him in the back of the cop car until they could figure out what happened. Wife number one told the police that her husband had a short temper, and this wasn't the first time he threatened her life. When they spoke with the Vang children, they verified what their mother said was true. The St. Paul police booked Chai Vang for felony assault, and they removed all the weapons from his house, including his steel-tipped arrows, his Browning hunting rifle, and his Colt 38 pistol. Chai's wife decided not to press charges, but she was basically done with him. Two months later, she packed up their five kids and moved to Milwaukee to be closer to her parents. Fang started a relationship with the woman who he had cheated on his wife with. She eventually became wife number two, but the relationship was pretty short-lived and was volatile. She thought Chai was stepping out on their marriage, so she showed up at his workplace to confront him with a baseball bat. When she couldn't find Chai because he was hiding from her, she took a big swing and smashed the window out of his truck. Another time, Chai was putting together a business deal and had borrowed $3,000 in cash. He left that money on top of his dresser. When wife number two saw it, she scooped it up and went right to the casino. Her plan was to win big, and she would replace the $3,000 she took and keep the additional winnings. Of course, this didn't work out, because the house always wins, and she lost Chai's $3,000. When he found out, he almost choked her to death. The police were involved, and this time no one was arrested, but they worked out a plan to separate the couple. The child they had together was given to Chai's mother and sister to care for. Chai would remain in St. Paul, and he paid for a one-way bus ticket to California for wife number two. The relationship only lasted about a year. Fang met and quickly married wife number three in 2003. They had one child together, and it was Fang's seventh child. Chai Fang was rarely concerned about rules or appearances. 
and his St. Paul suburban city folk neighbors weren't impressed with some of the happenings at the Vang homestead. Chai went well beyond raising backyard chickens. He kept a rooster that woke the entire neighborhood up prior to alarm clocks going off. Chai openly butchered chickens in his backyard, which was shocking for some who thought chicken just showed up in packages in the grocery store. In 2003, Chai was low on money as usual, but wanted another rifle for hunting. He found a Saiga SKS 7.62 by 39 rifle that came with a scope and a low ticket price that fit his budget. The weapon was really more of a combat rifle and was underpowered for deer hunting, but the price was right. One of Chai's co-workers sold him a large piece of hunting property in a land contract deal. It was 40 acres in Minnesota that had a five-bedroom home on the property. The land contract was for $176,000, and Chai's monthly payment was $1,260. The Vang family always made that payment on time, but they were extremely stretched, and financially, they were house poor. They ran out of money before they got to the end of the month and put the overspill on a credit card. Sometimes, Chai would poach deer with his bow and arrow to help stretch the family's food budget, Chai also paid wife number one $600 per month in child support since they had five kids together. He also had three additional kids with a mistress in California, and it was never reported if he paid her anything in child support. Chai Vang was a grinder, and he picked up a second job, so he typically worked 16 to 18 hours a day, five days each week to make ends meet. His primary job was working at Excel which was a company that hauled auto parts from a warehouse to different locations. In 2004, he started that second job, where he worked from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. as an independent contractor for a courier delivery service. Then he worked at least 10-hour days with his primary job at Excel. This violated the state's rules with his commercial driving license that limited drivers to 11 hours per day on the road. Excel never found out about the violation, else they would have likely ended Chai Vang's employment. Even working in a perpetually tired state, Chai's co-workers liked him. Besides thinking he was hardworking and reliable, he was a pleasant person and swallowed criticism. At work, Chai was able to control and suppress his temper. Vang loved nature and enjoyed hunting and fishing, but he showed little regard for the rules and regulations that came with the territory. In 2001, he only purchased one fishing license, which allowed him to take 15 fish. When the game warden checked in with Chai, he had over 150 fish. His wife and his two kids had been there fishing with him, so the warden was generous and allowed them each 15 fish. The Vang family kept 60 fish and had to release the rest. The warden wrote Chai a small fine of $465, which was much smaller than the Lao dictated, so he got off with a minor slap on the wrist. In April 2002, Chai and her friend were deer hunting. At that time, he had to borrow a rifle since the police had confiscated his. There were four deer in total, and they legally shot two deer that they had tags for on property that they were on. But then they chased the remaining two deer onto another property, where they were trespassing, and their deer tags were no longer valid. A deputy caught them, and both hunters admitted that they knew what they were doing was illegal. The officer wrote them each a $244 ticket. Chai's friend paid his fine, but Chai did not. They issued a warrant for Chai Vang's arrest. On November 20th, 2004, Chai finished up work for the week and arrived home by 2 a.m. He collected all his hunting gear and jumped into a car with his two friends. The group headed to Wisconsin, to a small town called Meteor a place that even many from Wisconsin haven't heard of. It was a town south of Hayward and northeast of Rice Lake. The population for Meteor was 159 people and extended 35 square miles. The land there was a mixture of public and private. On November 21, 2004, Chai and his hunting party started their day on public land. Chai took a shot at a deer but missed, so he began tracking it and went off on his own. He was lost and wasn't sure where he was going. Chai ran into two hunters that gave him directions. There was a miscommunication, and they accidentally pointed Vang in the wrong direction. 
Chai was supposed to be back at base camp because his hunting party wanted to drive back to Minnesota at a reasonable time. But like most motivated hunters, Chai really wanted to return home with a deer on the opening weekend of rifle season. As he walked along, he saw an empty tree stand and climbed into it. What Chai Vang may not have realized was that he had wandered onto private property that was owned by Terry Willers and Bob Crotto. They had purchased the land in 1998, and that weekend there were 15 people in their hunting party. Some were out hunting, and others were still in the cabin. Terry Willers was out walking the property when he saw Vang sitting in a tree stand. Willers got on his radio to ask his friends back in the cabin if there was supposed to be a person in that tree stand. No one was aware of anyone who should have been there. Willers asked Kai Vang where he had come from and what hunting party he was with. Vang responded, but Willers really didn't understand what he said. He told Vang that he needed to leave because he was on private property. Vang said he had seen no trespassing signs or fences, so he was not aware he had stumbled onto private land. Willers told Vang that he should have been using a compass. Vang apologized and climbed out of the tree stand. Willers pointed eastward and told Vang that that was the way out. Instead of following Terry Willers' directions, Chai Vang headed south as the trail was easier to walk. Terry Willers followed Vang for a little to ensure he was properly seeing himself out. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Hi, podcast listeners. I need to tell you about Ana Luisa Jewelry. I think my listeners will appreciate this company crafts high-quality jewelry at very affordable prices, starting at $39. They are carbon neutral, from their packaging to their products, because Ana Luisa cares about their footprint on the planet. Their designs are unique and will make you feel empowered, elegant, and fashionable. Two of my favorite necklaces from Ana Luisa, and that's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A, But my two favorite necklaces are the Temple Green and the Hannah Lee Heart. The Temple Green is a layered necklace that features two gold chains and a green banded gemstone pendant that is just beautiful. Such a vibrant, pretty green. I've been wearing that necklace when I film videos over on TikTok. The Hannah Lee Heart necklace features a shimmering heart pendant with a gold chain. The pendant is a deep, beautiful red, which is my favorite color. The necklace is really warm and feminine, and I can see why it's so highly rated. Anna Luisa is offering my listeners a discount. Go to shop.analuisa.com slash beyond for 20% off the entire Anna Luisa website. That's shop.analuisa.com slash beyond. I know that you're going to love their jewelry. Please use the link shop.analuisa.com slash beyond so they know I sent you. I'll put the link in the show notes and it will be up on the website as well. Now, back to the show. At 11.30 a.m., Willers radioed the cabin again to give them an update. He said that there was a rat in the tree stand, but he was sent packing. Bob Crotto had been in the cabin, and he was upset. He wanted to talk with the trespasser to find out what his deal was, and he wanted to remind him that he was on private property. His presence was not welcome there. Denny Drew was a friend of Bob's and was also in the cabin. He wanted to tag along because he thought this might get interesting. Bob Crotto and Denny Drew headed out the door. Bob's son, Joey Crotto, Denny Drew's brother-in-law, Lauren Hessebeck, and Denny's friend, Mark Reut, all followed Bob out the door because they were curious to see what was going to happen. None of the five men took their firearms, and they headed out to speak with Chai Vang. This was where the escalation began. And both sides did not agree on how the events unfolded. Bob Crotto was direct, and he wanted to know how the hell Vang walked across 400 acres of private land that surrounded his property. Vang explained again that he didn't see any trespassing signs. Bob demanded that Vang tell him his name. Vang refused, and that information wasn't owed to anyone. Bob Crotto really turned up the intensity. And he said he was sick of Hmong assholes coming onto his land. 
He told Vang that if he ever caught him on his property again, he would kick his Asian ass. He again demanded Vang's name. Bob's son, Joey Cradle, then stepped in front of Vang so he couldn't walk away. But Bob told his son just to let him go. He again told Vang to follow the trail out and to never return. When Vang spun around to head off the property, the men noticed he had his hunting back tag, and they told Vang that they would report his name to the sheriff. Even though it was unseasonably warm, Vang had been wearing a ski mask. So he figured he wouldn't be identified, but had forgotten that his back hunting tag had his name on it. Vang's tag had been flipped up, so Bob Crotto strode over and flipped it down so he could read it. Bob read out loud to the group, 0685505. In 2002, they had convicted Vang of trespassing, and if he received another conviction, they could revoke his hunting privileges. But the incident was over now. The six men got back into their ATVs and were going back to the cabin. As Vang was walking away, the whole incident had him seething. Vang and the group of men were approximately 30 yards apart. Willer said he saw Vang stop, turn around, take his rifle off his shoulder, take a knee, and aim. Terry Willers was the only one who had a gun since he had been out on foot, and no one from the cabin had brought any firearms. Willers was in bright blaze orange and was an easy target. Vang says Willers shot first, and Willers said Vang shot first. Either way, the first shot Vang took at Willers missed him as he dropped to the ground, trying to find some cover. When Willers hit the dirt, he landed on his rifle, and he could not pick up the gun and turn before Vang got off a second shot, which hit Willers in the lower neck, rendering him paralyzed. Vang felt that if he didn't shoot Willers, then Willers would have shot him. Vang then turned his attention to the other men who were on their ATVs. Mark Royd slunk down as he sat on his machine and instinctively put up his left arm to protect himself. Vang's next shot struck Mark in the upper arm, and the bullet traveled out of his shoulder. The bullet was deformed when it exited the shoulder. Then it punched a large hole in his head in the front of his left ear. It fractured his skull, passed through his brain, and exited out the back of his head. The impact threw Mark off the ATV, and he fell onto his back. Mark Royt died almost immediately. His ATV had been in gear and was moving forward slowly without the rider. Both Joey and Bob Crotto were fleeing as Vang shot Denny Drew in the chest. The bullet damaged some of his organs as he laid on the ground. He was alive, but it wasn't looking good for him. Next, Vang pursued Lauren Hassebeck and fired three close-range shots. The third one hit Lauren, which caused him to fall to the ground, where he remained still. Vang assumed he was dead and ran after Bob Crotto, who was a sitting target in his blaze orange hunting attire. As Bob ran, he radioed the cabin from his walkie-talkie. He told his neighbor and friend, Alan Lasky, to bring the guns. Bob's brother, Steve Crotto, was in the cabin and used his cell phone to call his friend, who was a DNR warden. Since they were in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, phone reception was an issue. The call kept breaking up, and then it would drop. The warden tried driving around to find better reception, but then just decided the situation was serious enough to radio for help. All law enforcement in the area were called in. Meanwhile, Vang fired one round at Bob Crotto, which missed him, so Vang fired a second time, hitting Bob in the chest and killing him instantly. Terry Willers was alive and laying on the ground. He was getting the feeling back in his fingers, and he radioed the cabin. His daughter, Jessica Willers, heard her dad's voice and became anguished. While Terry Willers was calling for help, Vang sprinted to close the gap between him and Joey Crotto. Vang took the shot, 65 yards out, and hit Joey in the lower back. Joey was hurt and struggled to escape, while Vang realized that he was out of bullets. His magazine held 10 rounds, and he had shot two at Terry Willers, one at Mark Royt, 
one at Denny Drew, three at Lauren Hessebeck, two at Bob Crottle, and one at Joey Crottle. Vang reloaded and shot Joey two more times from behind, putting that last bullet in his head. Vang's hunting jacket was reversible, and he heard an ATV coming, so he turned the coat inside out, hiding the blaze orange and showing the camouflage side. He crouched down and hid near a curve in the trail. It was Alan Lasky and Jessica Willers, riding on the ATV, coming out to help Jessica's wounded father. Fang figured they were armed, so he waited until the ATV was past him. He shot Jessica Willers, and the bullet entered her left buttock and exited her abdomen. She was sitting on the ATV behind Alan Lasky, so the bullet left her stomach and entered Alan's lower spine and abdomen, instantly paralyzing him from the waist down. Jessica fell off the back of the ATV. Vang ran closer and shot Alan through his right buttock, and he fell off the ATV. Vang fired one more fatal shot at Alan, which entered his back and exited through his chest. Jessica was trying to pull herself along the ground, and Vang fired a shot through her neck. Later on, Chai Vang would claim that Alan Lasky was armed with a rifle, but everyone who survived the incident said that Alan and Jessica were not armed. Carrying a rifle while driving with a passenger on the back of an ATV would have been a hard task. When law enforcement searched and collected evidence at the crime scene, there was not a rifle found by the dead bodies. Jessica's death was probably the most egregious, since she was shot in the back, found dead on the ground laying in the fetal possession. Vang went to find his rifle scope so he could leave, but he realized that Lauren Hesebeck was still alive. Vang said, You're not dead yet? He raised his weapon and was preparing to shoot one more time. Lauren grabbed Terry Willer's rifle with one hand as he dove to the ground to take cover. Vang's shots went over Lauren's head. Lauren's arm had been wounded from when Vang originally shot him, and even though Lauren Hesebeck had a gun full of bullets, he had an arm that wouldn't work, so he couldn't properly take aim. Lauren tried to pull the trigger, but the safety was on. He was unfamiliar with Willer's gun and felt around for the safety. Lauren released the safety mechanism and fired off a round, which never hit the intended target. He heard Vang pull the trigger on his weapon, and it made that distinct metallic clicking sound that meant Vang was out of bullets. Lauren had bullets but couldn't shoot, and Vang could shoot but had no bullets, so it seemed like an improbable ending to the incident. Jessica Willers and Alan Lasky took the same one bullet. Alan took an additional two, and Jessica took one more. Then Lauren Hesebeck had two to three bullets shot at him. Chai Vang fled the property and tossed any remaining ammunition. Later on, he would say he did so because he didn't want to shoot any more deer hunters. Vang ran into a solo hunter who was riding an ATV and was not affiliated with the Willers Crotto hunting party. Vang said he was lost, and this person told him to hop on. He drove them back to his truck that he had parked on the main road. They had already given law enforcement a description of the shooter, and a warden happened to be waiting at the truck. The man driving the ATV asked the warden to help his passenger, Chai Vang, since he was lost. The warden immediately took Vang into custody, and they sent him to the Sawyer County Jail. Fang's bail was set at $2.5 million, which was probably an amount never heard of before in that jurisdiction. When law enforcement made it to the crime scene, Bob Crotto, Joey Crotto, Alan Lasky, Mark Royt, and Jessica Willers were dead. They rushed Denny Drew into the operating room. He initially survived, but he had many complications, so they took him to Marshfield on a helicopter, and that was where he passed away. Terry Willers and Lauren Hesebeck survived. Lauren went back to the crime scene a few days after he underwent surgery and took police through the details of the incident. Bob and Joey Crotto had a joint funeral, and Steve Crotto was racked with guilt since he didn't leave the cabin to try and save them that day. When Vang was booked into jail, the sheriff was chilled by how calm the suspect was. When detectives asked Fang what happened, 
He gave them three different versions of the story. And eventually, when a Chicago Tribune reporter called for an interview, Fang gave her a fourth version. Versions 2, 3, and 4 were very similar and were mostly in agreement, but version number 1 was bizarre. Fang said Terry Willers took his rifle, then laid his friends on the ground, and shot them in the back. He said Willers was wearing gloves, then handed the gun back to him. Investigators called bullshit immediately on the story and told Fang that they had been to the crime scene. They knew what happened, and this was a blatant fabrication. Fang's different versions of the incident were used against him and played a role in destroying his credibility during the trial. The judge did not allow Chai Fang's prior arrest record to be admitted at trial, so the jury wouldn't find out about his incidents he had with his wives. The case had become volatile, and was one of the largest cases in the area. With community emotions running high, the judge brought in an outside jury. They picked the jury members from Madison's Dane County, bussed everyone the four and a half hours to Sawyer County, and sequestered the jurors in Hayward, Wisconsin. Chai Suo Vang's trial began on September 10, 2005 and took place at the Sawyer County Courthouse in Hayward, Wisconsin. The well-known DA, Peg Lottenschlager, prosecuted the case. She thought Chai Vang was typical of the defendants she had seen. He was angry, manipulative, violent, and victim-blaming. In every incident where he had become violent, he said the victim caused his actions by disrespecting him. During his psychological evaluation, they believed he had a major depressive disorder. Fang said he heard voices of an evil shaman. And when people berated him when he was driving trucks for work, he often thought about running them off the road. Fang did not meet the criteria for legal insanity, so that avenue of defense was not open to him. There were conflicting reports about who fired the first shot. When the incident started, Fang said Willers took the first shot at him about 100 feet out, and this was why he returned fire in self-defense. There were no shell casings found from Willer's gun, even though later on during the incident, Lauren Hesebeck grabbed the rifle and fired around at Vang. When Lauren Hesebeck testified, he said no one fired a shot before Vang removed a scope from his rifle and started shooting at them. The defense and the prosecution did not ask any ballistics or forensics experts to give opinions on who fired first. This was a smart strategy for both sides, since the risks were too great. If Vang fired the first shot, then he had little chance at a defense. If Willers fired the first shot, it would give Vang's claim of self-defense some merit. Lauren admitted that Bob Crotto had problems with Minnesota Hmong deer hunters trespassing on his land. When Willers first encountered Vang in the tree stand, he radioed back to the cabin and used the term mud duck, which was terminology used to refer to Minnesota residents interloping in western Wisconsin. The defense team argued that this term had a racial undertone, since Willers did not know that Vang was from Minnesota. Whether that term had a racial connotation, it certainly was not a term of endearment, and was analogous to southern Wisconsinites calling Illinois visitors fibs. Vang said when the group confronted him, they yelled racial slurs. Lauren Hesebeck testified that Bob Crotto called Vang a Hmong a-hole, but Vang claimed the slurs were more substantial. When Vang testified in his own defense, he said that he feared for his life and only fired his weapon because he was fired upon first and was almost hit. He said he shot two of the victims in the back because they were disrespectful towards him. In jail, Vang had given an interview to a reporter, and the prosecution played that tape for the jury. He had stated that three of the victims deserved to die because they didn't know how to talk to him respectfully. The prosecution asked Fang if Mark Reut, Denny Drew, and Terry Willers deserved to die. Fang said they didn't. The prosecutor asked Fang if Mr. Crotto deserved to die. He said yes, since he started the confrontation. Fang said Joey Crotto deserved to die because he accused Fang of flipping him off and he stepped in front of Vang to stop him from leaving during the argument. Vang said Alan Lasky deserved to die since he had a gun and threatened his life. 
But there was no rifle ever found, and both Alan Lasky and Jessica Willers had been shot in the back while they were on the ATV. Fang's lawyers tried to do damage control and claimed his responses were because of a language barrier. They said Vang used the phrase, deserve to die, but what he meant was the circumstances that contributed to their deaths. The prosecution dismantled Chai Vang's claim to self-defense, based on the physical evidence that the majority of the victims were unarmed. Vang chased and shot them in the back or the side. Many victims were shot multiple times. On September 16, 2005, 36-year-old Chai Suo Vang was found guilty of six counts of first-degree intentional homicide and three counts of attempted homicide. On November 8, 2005, they sentenced him to six consecutive life terms, plus 70 years, which was effectively a life sentence without parole. Vang's attorneys did not appeal his case because there were no grounds for an appeal. On May 15, 2007, Chai Vang wrote his own appeal, He said the judge should have suppressed the statements that he made to the police and the reporter when he was in jail, which led to his telling of different versions of what happened. A three-judge panel rejected this appeal. Chai Vang is in prison in Animosa State Penitentiary in Iowa. 42-year-old Bob Crotto married his high school sweetheart, Jeannie, and started a concrete business. He had two sons, Joey and Carter. 20-year-old Joey Crotto helped his dad build a hunting cabin, and worked at his dad's business. 43-year-old Alan Lasky was Bob's neighbor and helped him build the cabin. He loved hunting and fishing, and of course, the Green Bay Packers. Mark Reut was only 28 years old and had his whole life ahead of him. He was a good friend of Denny Drew, and they shared a love of racing. Denny was like a father to him. 55-year-old Denny Drew was close to the Crotto family, His daughter got married two weeks after his death and didn't have her dad to walk her down the aisle. 27-year-old Jessica Willers was Terry Willers' daughter, and she had been in the middle of planning her wedding. 48-year-old Lauren Hesebeck survived the incident. He was married to Denny Drew's sister and was also his best friend. 47-year-old Terry Willers survived the shooting. He had a background in carpentry and home building. Terry enjoyed snowmobiling and riding motorcycles. He got over his physical injuries, but the emotional wounds from losing his daughter never healed. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and sound design were performed by me, Renee. If you like the show, please leave me a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much, everyone.